All right, so thank you all for joining us for our weekly informatics seminar. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce and welcome Constance Steinkuhler uh, from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, she is an associate professor in the uh, di of digital media uh, and the co-director of the Games Learning Society Institute um, at the Wisconsin Institute of Discovery. Uh, Constance was a advisor, a senior policy analyst to the White House Office of Science and Technology in 2011-2012. Uh, her work covers a range of games, neuroscience, interdisciplinary learning, uh, learning analytics, mixed methods, literary theory. Um, it's a fantastic sort of interdisciplinary look into the possibilities of games research. Um, we're very happy to have her here, and I'm going to cut this short because she's about to tell us a lot more about this herself. So. <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks for having me, and I definitely want to thank Josh and Andre and Walt and Mimi and everyone for such a wonder wonderful day so far, um, and Rebecca, who missed dinner because of my poor scheduling. Um, we've had a great day getting to know the program here and meeting people. So um, the standards are, the bar is set really high, the social hour after this better be good. <laughs> I realize that I'm standing between you and free food and alcohol, so I plan on being entertaining and then getting out of the way. Um, so I want to talk about games and the intellectual life of play. Um, a lot of times when I go out to talk to the public, it's typically because I'm the so-called fun czar of games. How I got that title, um, while I worked in the Obama administration, I am not really sure. For a while I thought it meant that I was fun, and it turns out that's not what they meant. So, uh, and I never got it to shift to Duchess, which I thought was a lot cooler, but no one else thought it was cool, so instead I just got the title of fun czar for um, advising the government on digital media and kids, especially around games, which is weird, right? If you think about my title was not digital media and was not um, other sort of interactive media and other sort of euphemisms, it was straight up video games um, as a senior policy analyst. So I think it is telling about where things have moved in our domain. How many of you here are in games in some fashion? So yeah, go us, right? Um, I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. First, I wanted to actually talk about what I do my scholarly work on. Um, so I spent a good decade of my life looking not just at video games, but video games and learning. I'm currently in a school of education, which um, may be odd to some people, um, but uh, part of my work, I spent a long time, I sort of started by, well, let me go back. I'm actually old enough to say that there was almost no game studies when I started graduate school. And so when I wanted to study something like games, I had to look at TV and effects, sort of media effects around television. So when I went to do my dissertation, I ended up doing a two and a half year cognitive ethnography of games. My background is, on, uh, is more in sort of educational psychology, analyzing cognition, but at the time there was really no studies out there on specifically cognitive change, learning, and games. So I stepped back and did an ethnography, and a lot of my work has been nomadic, so I tend to follow what a lot of people do and what's popular play, not necessarily what's the highest brow play or the most complex games. So I've studied things like Lineage 1. At that time, it was the global game, um, a game by NCSoft uh, out of Korea. Then Lineage 2, which also globally dominated RuneScape. Of course, many of us spent a lot of time in RuneScape for free. World of Warcraft, which we had a great lunch conversation about why we're still playing World of Warcraft is sort of beyond me, but yet we love hate it. That was a lot of the work that I cut my teeth on. My dissertation was this long ethnography of um, what is the intellectual life of being a member, a community member in one of these domains. Um, and this is the point where I point, where I uh, provide a slide that is basically all of the conclusions. How many of you are students? Yeah, so this is what it looks like when you have a dissertation and it's boiled down to one slide. <laughs> there it is, that's my dissertation, it happens one day. Um, and I can boil it down even further. So uh, with the help of the MacArthur Foundation and as I became tenure track faculty, we decided to pursue specific variables that we thought were the biggest variables in play in terms of online game 
community membership. Things like science, literacy, notions of cosmopolitanism or the ability to understand networks and diversity in networks, um, and other sorts of topics. So I thought, well, and then of course, not only did we do empirical studies, but we ran an after school lab for a couple of years trying to understand what was the relationship between these intellectual practices and the school lives of kids. So I thought maybe I'd take a little bit of time to dive into some of that older research to show you what this stuff looks like. Um, so science was one of the topics we cared a lot about. Um, and a lot of this work came out of um, a kid in the ethnography that was one of my main informants. His name online was Steel Dragon, high school kid between his junior and senior year, um, who in the game Lineage 1 that I was studying at that time, uh, boss monsters would spawn at particular places in the virtual world, so people would sit around and wait for them to spawn in that area. And you'd sit there bored, so you'd end up socializing and arguing about various things. And so Steel Dragon and a bunch of his uh, friends in the game, or I think friends might be an expansive term, other kids in the game, were sitting around in an area camping a boss monster, and they started to debate um, what would be the, the most effective way to take down the dragon. So as they started arguing, <coughs> excuse me, they started uh, debating what kinds of materials, equipment, what roles would be the right configuration to do this best, whatever best meant. And as this conversation continued, over the summer they started putting together Excel spreadsheets of every combination of equipment and people and weapons. And then they started mathematizing those relationships, building our, uh, models around what would be the solution to this particular game mechanic. And then they started arguing about these models, uh, what, whose model was the most predictive of success, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, many of you are in education, are you? No. OK, because this is normal. Thank you. I mean, this is the point where most of us in education, especially if you're in science education, are like, this is so beautiful. <laughs> Children are doing this. It's so great, right? This is straight up what we try to do in science. AAA standards. This is what Common Core includes. Thinking about a phenomenon, building a model to predict its behavior, and understanding the model in terms of its ability to predict, right? How, uh, how much fidelity does it have with the phenomenon itself? It's really tough to get to happen in classrooms. We spend a lot of time and a lot of labor and thinking of how we could make classrooms better for this activity. And here are kids doing it in a game. So when he starts sharing these documents with me, et cetera, I get super excited. And I'm like, Steel Dragon, do you know that what you're doing is science? And he's like, no, what we're doing is cheating the game. <laughs> So it's an interesting example in a story I like to use because um, the idea that they're doing science in these spaces now is not a shocker. At the time, it was a huge shocker. Uh, but it's also interesting that, the, that it's not seen as uh, science-related. It's not seen as having anything to do with science. When in fact, you know, now our center sits in the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, and this is exactly how scientists who work on models and simulations think about their science work and predicting systems. So they're not that far away, and yet for a student in science, these two things have nothing to do with each other, which says something about our gameplay and how we frame games. It also says something about education and how we frame science. So after that, with the help of the MacArthur Foundation and Spencer Foundation, we started doing some empirical studies a bit more focused to understand, are these practices representative? Are these practices just a couple precocious, amazing kids doing cool stuff? What's the story? For those of you who play um, World of Warcraft, this is, this is a study we did that was right around the release of Burning Crusade, right before it. So everyone is sort of in stasis waiting for that new expansion to release. So we pulled 2,000 form threads, representative sample, confidence interval around 9%. And we looked at three main things. We looked to see, are they using in these random forum threads around a game like World of Warcraft, are they using scientific argument? For example, are they using evidence to back up their theories? Pretty simple, but even in political rhetoric, we don't do that so much. Um, are they using models to understand the game? So model-based reasoning of the sort I just described with Steel Dragon. And then this third thing about tacit epistemology, we wanted to make sure that we were not including 
false positives that would be something that was a bit more akin to reverse engineering. So when you're in a virtual space, there actually is an algorithm that's generating the phenomenon, and you could discover it, although that probably pretty be pretty hard in a game engine like World of Warcraft. But there is this sort of idea, right, that you could reverse engineer the code. Um, with the natural world, hopefully, we don't have that same notion. We don't think that there's code lying at the center of the universe that we are about to uncover or somehow reverse engineer. You're thinking about a model in a very different way. So we wanted to avoid false positives on that one. So there's sort of what we looked for and the actual distribution of percentages. Notice that down here with mathematical modeling, math is part of my background, I wanted to understand how many of them were actually um, using math in the way that we saw Steel Dragon use it. It's pretty exciting when you see kids mathematizing their world, if you're a math nerd like me. So there it is, there are the answers. Shocking percentages, but maybe let me walk through some of this and give you a sense of what it's like. Um, so is the talk productive? These are forums around World of Warcraft. There's a lot of trash talk and mom jokes, a lot of not that funny, and some very hilarious discussions around World of Warcraft. So it first, is it productive? And it turns out it is. So 86% uh, was what you would call social knowledge construction, meaning that they're working on a problem, not just simply engaged in social bantering. Although I think social bantering also is productive for kids in different ways and enjoyable. So. Um, a lot of that looked like a problem being posed, an answer, and then a second answer would be added, a third answer, there'd be some discussion, or the, or the discussion would trail off, leaving the last posted answer as sort of the right one. In terms of argument, um, doing pretty good. So obviously, you know, if you look at the first two ones, yes, they're either agreeing and elaborating, or they're arguing, about 37% of the time each. The use of data, that's pretty interesting, so, sorry. Um, so 28% of the time, they're actually using data or evidence to back up a claim. Again, not too shabby compared to typical rhetoric. A model-based reasoning. So if you think about what the story I told you about Steel Dragon, how often was this happening? Well, about 58% um, of the time, people were focused on systems and understanding feedback uh, and building models. Uh, Model-based reasoning was about 11% using that model and thinking of the model in terms of how well it predicted as a test of how good the model was, was lower. So about 10% of the time model-based reasoning of the articulated sort I told you about. Half that time they were thinking about the model in terms of prediction. And then down at math, math, mathematizing, it gets much lower. So 4% uh, mathematical modeling actually building equations as a form of proof. And then 1% was doing mathematical computation. So tiny percentage was also using explicit computation uh, as a way to make their argument. Looks pretty small, but let's take a look at what a post looks like. So here's an example post from our data set. Um, so the very first, he starts off saying an unfortunate fact is that there's no shadow nuke. So he's picking up a topic in the thread. That's social knowledge construction, building on each other's ideas. The next part, he says, I put together my own spreadsheet, which goes into more detail and takes into account exactly what happens to spells with regard to talents. So this is what we would call model-based reasoning. If I got anything wrong, feel free to email me at blah. But if you read up on WowWiki and check out the coefficients used in theorycraft, you'll find out that I'm consistent with respect to them. So he's referencing outside resources, which is important. We don't want people just rebuilding the same answers again and again. And then finally down, if Flame were empowered to the point that it received 65% of plus damage, then Shadow would be up around 45% DPS scaling, blah, 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 blah. So here what you're saying is that he's proposing a change in variables and predicting what would happen because of that change. So that would be model testing prediction. That model uh, is what's interesting. So the model looks something like that. So when we said, building a mathematical model is 4% of the data set, it's a pretty salient 4%. Right? I have a degree in math, and I play Shadow Priests, which this was about, and even I had a hard time sort of understanding the scaling factors he's talking about. They hold, they're just complicated. So epistemologies, uh, finally, when we looked at what is the overall tenor or the overall attitude toward knowledge that we're seeing in the talk, 
I should first point out that a good 27% of it was uncodable. When we run into data that doesn't fit part of our coding scheme, we don't jam it in. We simply say it's not codable. And what, uh, the breakdown looked something like this. So about 30% of the audience was absolutist. Whose mom believes it's such and such? So this is the kind of attitude that says that there's a big T truth. And usually speakers who talk about big T truth think that they have it. So that's absolutist. 5% was relativist. It's all just opinions. The experts don't agree. right? But 65% was evaluative. Now what's interesting here is that Without an evaluative stance toward knowledge, science doesn't really have a big point, does it? Why would you debate models if, in fact, either experts don't agree and it's just a free-for-all, or there's a big T truth and you and God perhaps have it, right? Um, so pretty good, uh, I think. Um, it starts to look even more interesting when you compare it to other trends at that time. So compared to Kuhn's data, this, her data are about 15 years before mine. But she had a massive data set that she looked at across educational level, geographic area, gender, et cetera. And what you find is a very different distribution in the United States. So in the United States, what you find is that 50% of people hold an absolutist view toward knowledge, and only 15% hold an, uh, an evaluative one. Right? So here you have this really interesting difference between what would be considered typical American sort of argumentation and thinking about knowledge itself versus what you see on something like a game forum around a popular, not even the most complicated game um, that kids are playing, right? Uh, these are noteworthy differences. Now, I think um, there's a chicken and egg problem here. Is it that people with this kind of stance toward knowledge tend toward forums around their play spaces? It's probably true. I also think there's a, the other end of it where the community doesn't like stupid. So the community tends to punish verbally activities that are not adding to solutions of problems. So you end up with this sort of uh, norming people into an attitude toward the game if you're in this sort of forum community. So this is the kind of work that we did. Well, I should also say some American schools. Despite, um, for those of you, there's a couple of us, but the rest of us who are not in education. Um, so. Only one in five Americans is considered scientifically literate, despite mandatory education in science in most <laughs> states, though not all. Um, so despite all of our science education and all the work we do trying to get kids to do complicated th forms of science in classrooms, it turns out that um, America is not very science literate. By that I mean able to read the New York Times on a Tuesday. So I'm not setting the bar terribly high. And it turns out that previous studies of things like hands-on inquiry activities, project-based activities, the very pinnacle of what we think is great instruction in schools, like chemistry labs, like dissections, like physics, ex physics experiments, it turns out that broad national surveys of their impact shows that not only are they not science, they actually breed attitudes that are absolutely orthogonal to science. So in that chart about like, absolutist, relativist, evaluative, you end up fostering ideas inadvertently in some of those activities that lead kids to the very wrong stance toward what knowledge is about. And it's not that hard to do, right? Because if you think about, and I have personally done these in classrooms, so I'm going to just <laughs> say uh, it's, um, I'm pointing my finger at myself as well as other people, but you, you create these activities, right? And you think that you're getting your kids, like, finally, you're not doing the textbook. Finally, you're going to like do some science in the classroom. It's going to be a lab experiment. They're going to do some science. Stand back, everyone. And what happens? Well, the kids figure there is a right answer. It's the one the teacher has. They figure they will do the experiment over and over until they get that answer. And it turns out that those kinds of attitudes towards how science works are exactly the wrong ones for understanding why science would be important. So in science, in K through 12, in our more formalized ways in which we try to engage kids with these kinds of forms of thinking and habits of mind, we're not faring very well. So against that background, the kind of stuff you're seeing in play spaces is noteworthy. Now, um, I should also say something about, you know, it's possible in these studies that you simply have a group of 70 people or 50 people or 700 people who are super smart who are on the forums posting answers, like theory crafting, while the world sits around and waits for the right answer. So we looked at those, and it turns out that's not actually true. 
as a problem is harder and the conversation continues, meaning let's just say that the longer the post on a topic, the more complicated it is. It turns out that there's almost a two to one ratio of people engaged. So the longer the discussion, the harder the problem, the more people you need to solve it. So this is not merely a, a, a practice where you have a couple smart people coming up with the answer and then distributing that answer out. It's actually that people are collectively solving the toughest problems all together, incrementally. Um, and what's interesting about that is if you look at their forms of information sharing practices, you end up with forms of technology and human activity that look a lot like stuff that has, it looks structurally like what you see in other domains like campaigns, like information sharing and crowdsourcing around campaigns and mobilizing. So for someone like me, who I, I tend, the older I get, to think teaching should look much more like community organizing, it turns out that these forms of socio-technical interactions and structures actually look a lot more like campaigns than they do classrooms. Um, so why would the White House be interested in games, right? Hopefully that's something we're all asking ourselves. Why would you do policy work? My official uh, title in the White House, I work for the Office of Science and Technology Policy under John Holdren, who's still the science advisor for Obama. Um, and I was, uh, and I was brought in to deal explicitly with games. Well, first, um, it's the sheer fact that we have a president who actually values technology and values a youth vote and youth participation. So uh, once you shift to that model away from the two-term Bush administration before it, um, you need to include people in your policy making and thinking that might care and know something about what contemporary digital media looks like. Uh, I have to include this picture just simply because <laughs> it's my favorite part of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's okay. Um, so there's John Holdren, uh, who would be who was my boss. So um, the way the White House is organized in offices, you know, the president meets every morning at 7:30 with his advisors. So you have an advisor on sort of domestic affairs, an advisor on the economy, an advisor on foreign foreign affairs. You have one that's on science and technology. So that's John Holdren there, um, and he was my boss. Um, but if you look at Obama's his innovation strategy, games actually touch in multiple domains. So um, the idea of using games to do everything from address grand challenges of the 21st century, things like how can we dramatically decrease our energy consumption through the way we structure information around our new smart grid system, that's a gamification topic. All the way down to how do you educate people in science in classrooms now, that too could be a game comp. There are five kind of, actually there's more than five affordances, but five big affordances of why people in policy are interested in games. Um, first is simply that there's a sheer reach of the population. 97% of kids between the ages of 17, uh, 12 and 17 game. Most, game, most um, households now have not just one dedicated console, but two on average. The second is that games are just simulations, right? So. Um, I'm popular in science domains because as weird as what I do happens to seem, the moment I can show them games that are actual simulations of phenomena in science tends to, scientists tend to get very excited about it. Third, there's great data exhaust that comes off of them. None of this should be news for any of us, but that great <coughs> data exhaust that comes off of all of this interactivity in, a, in a, you know, an iPhone app, a tablet app, your computer, your console, all that amazing data exhaust uh, enables you to do continuous improvement through A-B testing, which is heretofore not easy to do in something like school materials or, um, you know, uh, campaign policies or other sort of like national level policies that you've rolled out, the idea that you can continuously improve it. But you can also personalize it so that if I know, um, if I can see differences in something like, you know, um, um, boys and girls in thinking about algebra, early pre-algebra, then I can start to sequence and tailor my instruction to better suit different audiences, whatever those differences may be. Four, it's very cost effective. I have the most hilarious conversations with people in the State Department about the benefits of using digital media 
rather than say just flying over a country and dropping pamphlets. It's totally amazing to me. I was like, so there's this thing called the internet, and you can do more than a website on it. You don't really have to, do we do that? Do we really fly over and drop pamphlets? Yes, we do. We do that. Turns out after you make something digitally, you can distribute it for near free on this thing called the internet. Thank you, government. Um, five, there, you know, and this one is probably the most important for me, that they are, in fact, what I would call architectures for engagement. Game design is absolutely about fine-tuning the learning of a complex system for the learner who is the user and absolutely polishing what that scaling up process looks like, especially in the beginning, right? So um, you do not have typical designers of educational materials sitting around asking themselves, okay, but what's it like the first two minutes? What's it like the first 10 minutes? What's it like the first 20 minutes? How do they know what to do next? That's not what most design of educational materials looks like, but that is exactly what you're doing in the game. Um, and it turns out that interest matters. So I'm gonna show a little bit more data. Um, you know, I had said that we ran this after school program for boys. Part of it was because in many of the empirical studies we were looking at showed like a lot of really interesting intellectual practices like the science stuff. So great, I can talk about what's happening around a game, but it's very hard to study the people behind the screen. In fact, my IRB said you're not allowed to ask anything about the people behind the screen. So you can extrapolate based on norms for different titles, but that's as far as you could go. So while all, while all this work, we were doing all this work in our lab, you know, um, it turns out that some of the main demographics for a game like World of Warcraft, boys, 18% uh, female players in World of Warcraft, so it's still predominantly boys. And yet, for example, how boys are faring in school is not showing any sort of aggregate differences even though games are massively popular. So at some point you have to ask yourself, well, what's this, what's happening, right? If I can show that games include and recruit all this fancy stuff, how come we're not seeing any sort of aggregated differences in schools or school performance? So we started this after school lab so we could say, well, let's take a bunch of kids and let's study them longitudinally over a year, two years, see what in the world happens around starting games, playing games, connecting to school or failing to connect to school and what happens next. So that's what we did. I'm gonna tell a story so I can actually show that engagement matters. All right, so we ran this after school program. We really went for maximum variation. So in, this, in these data, the point I wanna make is that we designed our samples so that all of our kids were recruited based on uh, one basic thing. You hated school and you loved games. But half of those kids were faring fine in school. The other half were not. Half of them were from rural areas. The other half were from urban areas. So we did maximum variation in our sample because we had no real, there was no literature research base to guess what variables might be important, right? So in this sample, half of our kids read at grade level, half read below grade level, um, up, to my, up to five grades below level. So some of our participants were much lower. Um, so on average, you know, our, our participants were 10th grade average, but reading at the 7th grade level. Does that give you a sense? By the way, in America, boys on average read two grades below level. That should be troubling. You know that? I should, that should be sad. That's true. All right, so we started them off. We looked at their gaming play. We looked to see how do they get to high-end gaming? How do we resource them? So they showed an interest in narratives, and next thing you know, next week, oh my gosh, I have World of Warcraft novels just sitting right here. What's going to happen, right? <laughs> uh, and then we watched to see what happened. Uh, one of my doctoral students actually followed him for a second year after that to see, did it change anything? Did it matter? What happened? What endured? But that's a different story. I want to tell a story about why interest matters. So in the ethnographic work I had done, uh, found that you know, we did some studies of, first off, that games don't, replace, games don't replace literacy. There's a lot of fear in America that you know, waxes and wanes about kids are playing video games and they're not reading. <laughs> well, it turns out that you know, actually games require a lot of reading and games are not replacing reading. Um, so, First, we sort of, in the ethnography, we documented what were all the literacy practices. But then we went back in and said, okay, well, what are the texts that they're encountering? And it turned out from those studies that about half of them are actually expository text, which is considered a harder form of text to teach younger middle schoolers. Uh, reading level is about 12th grade, not too bad. Um, 
and about 4% academic words. So if you look at just the lexical profile of how much of that is academic talk, about 4%, which is good, fine. If you wanted a student to learn academic vocabulary, you would not give them a text that was 50% academic language. You'd give them a text that was somewhere 2, 4, 5% because they need to be able to read it at a just right level. So they understand the text, it's just a new word that they can actually figure out the meaning for because they understand the rest of the context. Does that make sense? Okay. I nerd a little bit on this topic because it's my favorite. All right, so that's what text looks like around games. But what was interesting in this after school program was that all of our students read with comprehension. All of them, all of them, all of them. Now remember I just said that half of them read below level, two grades or more below level, and the average is like three plus grades below level. So that's interesting because they're reading 12th grade text. And we know that because we did this study. And we know that they understand it because they're, we're monitoring what they read and its reading level, and then we're watching them implement inferences drawn from the text in their gameplay. So they are reading with perfectly great comprehension. So we wanted to understand, okay, well here's a weird thing. These are kids that half of them are not doing well in reading at school, and yet all of them are reading with comprehension in their game spaces. So we did a study looking at that. Um, we did a study where we, first we assessed their reading level because we didn't know if it changed since they were last diagnosed. We did a QRI test. And then we had them do some pre-tests about like, pre-tests of sort of knowledge about the topic, and do you like reading, attitudes toward reading. And then they were in, they did one of two readings. One of them was a game-based reading that was literally pulled from the resources they were using for gameplay. And the other one was a school-based reading that we literally pulled text from their um, textbook that they hadn't read yet, right? And then we gave them comprehension measures. Now, all kids in our program had to read both texts. We sort of counterbalanced so we wouldn't have ordering effects, right? Okay, so this is what um, a game-related text looked like. There it is. This is what a school-related text looked like. And again, remember, these are pulled from their actual reading stuff. And here's what happened. So when we looked at measures of, um, when we looked for differences, this is an absolute flat line. So we gave them a reading test. We, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one part. We gave them this reading test. Then when we pulled text from the game environment and text from their school textbooks, we made sure it was at the level that was appropriate to them. Does that make sense? So your Alfred, Alfred is reading at the eighth grade level. I'm going to scramble until I find eighth grade level reading for games, eighth grade level reading for school, and now I'm going to have you read them both. I'm going to see what do you do. Right. So we did that, and there were absolutely no differences. No strategy differences, no differences whatsoever. Texts were treated the same. We thought, well, that's really weird because in fact, when we watch them in our after school program, they're reading text that is way beyond their comprehension level and they're doing fine. So why would we see no differences between school and game text? Because obviously there's some form of differences between their performance in reading in schools versus games. So we scratched our heads, we thought about it, we thought some more about it, and we thought, well, let's redo this because in the first study, what we had done was artificially deflate the level of difficulty. Remember I said that the game text is 12th grade? But if I know that you're a fifth grade reader, I actually pull text that would be fifth grade, which by the way is really hard to find. Not so hard in a, in a textbook, but it's really hard to find in a game text, in a game website. Um, so we had artificially deflated difficulty. So we were like, okay, let's, let's rethink it, let's rethink it. So this time, Let's actually instead, what happens if they choose topic? So rather than me picking the text that you're going to read around the game, we'll do one more text, you pick the topic. And this time what we did is we said, they picked the topic, they gave us three, so we choose one of those. It had to be at least 12th grade. It had to be at least two grades too hard for them, based on what we knew. Um, so we kind of gave them a really tough text, right, <coughs> to sort of, emulate what we saw happening. And here's what we saw. So when participants choose topic, the text reading level we gave them was grade 13 on average. On average, it was 4.5 grades above their head. And yet despite those, when they were allowed to choose text, they read up to eight grades, up to eight grades above what they should have been able to read. 
What's even weirder is if you actually split that based on kids who were reading at level and kids that were not reading at level, so-called struggling readers and non-struggling readers, you find that that entire difference basically goes away statistically, right? So what happens is that once you let them choose topic, once they're reading about something they care about, the differences between these struggling and non-struggling readers just sort of went away. Okay, that should be like magic amazing. You should be like standing up, like rending your clothes. This is amazing, right? This is an amazing finding. Uh, but it's actually kind of no duh. Because all I'm actually saying is that when kids care about what they're reading, they actually can read well, right? And we had this great, oh, our lowest, our biggest difference, our 11th grader that was reading five grades below level, actually six grades below level, and one of his entry, uh, you know, I said I did pre-tests about, like, How, do you like reading? And we asked that he was like, no, well, I, I would, depends on what I'm reading, right? That's all it is. It turns out that it depends on what they're reading and whether or not they care. So my argument that interest actually matters, interest actually matters. It matters because in other environments, what we're assessing is human performance when you don't have interest or engagement. And interest and engagement are conflated with things like performance. So the fact that games are architectures for engagement matters. It's not like chocolate poured on the broccoli. It's not like something you do as a rounding error. It's that if people are not engaged in the system, then their performance does not reflect what they are capable of. So back to White House stuff. Um, so when I was there, a lot of the work that I did was around three big questions in the portfolio I worked on. The first one was, what games should exist that don't exist yet? Um, number two, how do you create this sort of innovation ecosystem to get those games to exist? And number three, like what kind of scientific discoveries can we make using the data streams and all of the amazing design and human engagement that happens through video games? That was sort of the basis of what I worked on in the White House through policy. And a lot of it really hinged around number two, figuring out ways that you can actually partner people and build an ecosystem for innovation in amazing games and amazing science discoveries. I have to use this picture because does anyone recognize it's the portal gun. Yay! We snuck the portal gun into one of the White House conference rooms. It's still on the shelf there. We totally snuck it in and we put it next to like all these like Mars equipment things. <laughs> I know, it's like the one big moment. I mean, there's other things I'm proud of in the White House, but that's really one of my biggest ones. We snuck in a portal gun through Secret Service and it's on a White House shelf to this day. So if you like watch CNN and you see like, you know, in the, I, in, yeah, if you see in the White House, you'll actually sometimes see a shelf, especially the science stuff, like the tech stuff, and there's actually a portal gun sitting there, and no one knows. So now you know, so you'll probably get in trouble now. Um, yeah, it's very cool to hold on. All right, so what do I mean by innovation ecosystem? A few words on this stuff. So a lot of it's partner building. For federal agencies, um, one thing that we worked on was, um, it turns out that a lot of agencies are thinking about games as a, as a means for reaching their populations. If you think about health agendas, uh, food safety, that digital media is something that the government actually does think about rather than big P policy mandating top down, thinking about ways to incentivize opt-in systems where people might shift their behavior, they do that. Maybe not as much as we'd like, but they do do that. Um, so when we first started convening this working group around games, we had 70 attendees across 23 agencies. By the time I left, we had 206 program officers funding games across 33 agencies and four White House offices. So that's a very positive number um, for investments in games from government. Now you'll notice a lot of that is the top three biggest um, slices of the budget. So a lot of DOD, of course the Department of Defense has been funding games and simulations for some time, right? That's not news. Um, but Department of Health and Human Services and Education coming in third. And then a lot of other interesting agencies as well. Um, <clears throat> the games industry has certainly been a great partner for building some of that innovation ecosystem. Though the games industry, if you were in this domain, is really super in flux. So right now what you have is a lot of, you know, it's the same thing as Hollywood. You get these big blockbuster companies that make really expensive titles 
that in order to have the returns on the incredible investment they just made of 50 million for a title, they end up remaking the same title over and over and over. I mean, I like Halo too a lot. <laughs> really, I do. But I'm, you know, we could have more than Halo, right? Um, and, but what's interesting is that just like film, there's now this really thriving indie scene um, that is really, I'm very excited about, that did not exist seven years ago, and it exists now for a lot of reasons, but some of them are mundane. The production tools got cheap. Distribution channels got more transparent, right? We may have a morass of apps on things like Google Play, but at least there's now an ocean of stuff. We used to not have that, so that's exciting. I would actually say it's the golden age of games. <laughs> Ingress, anyone? No? Okay. I know, I'm between you and the food and booze, so I'm not hurting. Um, so let me give some examples of what I think are amazing games for impact. Amazing games for impact that are totally not impact games, they're just indie games. Plague, anyone playing Plague Inc? I've totally. seen a, a play from involving the disease known as free t-shirts. Oh, well, there's that. But, you know, you have games about, you know, basically distribution of virus and how virus moves on a globe. That's amazing. That's a fun game people play that doesn't have to be assigned or cajoled. This War of Mine, a game I just, I wouldn't call it finished. I just finally gave up in a puddled mass of depression. Did anyone else play that? <laughs> amazing. Oh, I should say also... Plague, by the way, was made by one guy. One guy made this game, right? This war of mine, two guys in Poland. Two guys in Poland made a game. It's a war game, another war game, except for this time you get to play not as the soldiers. You get to play as actually the civilian survivors, survivors in a war-torn country. And let me tell you something, it's hard. This is a survival game that's really hard. You basically die of disease, Starvation or depression. I go with depression every single time. My character ends up huddled up on a bed, just like laying, quivering till she dies. It's so sad. <laughs> Two guys made this game, right? And if you're in the game scene, these are games that everybody plays. These are big titles. Um, an obvious another one, this driving cancer. A gentleman and now his wife is on his team. I think they might have some other people working, but it's basically him working through what it means to have a child with cancer. So this idea that, I mean, there's this thriving indie scene. We now have games that are not just games for impact, but there are these amazing games that are they are just, it's like an articulated market of the sort that we now have in television, which I think is awesome. So we have documentaries that are games. We have art pieces that are games. We have emotional pieces. We have funny pieces. We have shoot 'em up pieces, all of that. And that has only happened in the last seven or eight years thanks to so many amazing young designers, including people that are probably sitting in this room. Um, and finally, academics. You know, uh, in the end of the day, I did resign from the White House and came back to academics <clears throat> because I like it in this sector. If nothing else, in academics, you can't speak with absolute certainty and certain modality without actually knowing what you're talking about. Turns out politician, politician can. It's nice to be back in a crowd where people are like, no, actually, I don't think we know that. In fact, I don't think that's knowable. But thanks for being so certain about it. It's great. Um, so while we were there, we put together this academic consortium on games for impact. That entity now grew. There are 406 programs in game design. 406 programs in game design. Um, across the states, look how great California is doing. Um, 86 programs, 200 and... 335, I can't even read that number, I'm too old, uh, number of studios. It turns out that um, the next report is embargoed, but on Tuesday I go, to con I go back to Congress for a caucus, um, and the next report coming out actually talks about this incredible correlation between programs in higher ed, number of game design studios, and this number of jobs you are creating in a state, and the numbers are really persuasive. That is now organized into something called the Higher Education Video Game Alliance. I'm the president of this organization. And the mission is really just to underscore the cultural, scientific, and economic importance of video games. Not an agenda I am unfamiliar with. Um, and to help us organize across the universities, across these game design programs, to share things like best practices. How about connections to funders, all those agencies I talked about, doing some of the work of uh, loosely configuring and organizing and advocating for the programs of what we're doing in institutions of higher ed, including this program. 
Membership, right, we're now at 300 and some people and almost 100 institutions. So we've got about a fourth the audience. We're about a year old. But here's some of the coolest things I want to talk about with game programs. And I'll end here. But um, So a lot of it is, you can see 33% bachelor then graduates versus bachelor's only. But this is what I like. So we did some surveys. You know, we formally created ourselves as a non-for-profit. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we started doing some survey work, trying to understand what are these programs, and what are they doing, and what are they teaching, and who are they graduating, and who are they attracting. Well, check these numbers out. So if you look at um, video game design programs, the figure on the left here, comparing video game design programs to, say, computer and information sciences, engineering, arts, sort of adjacency fields, we have double the number of women. Given the last year we had in Gamergate, I'm just going to sit here and declare victory. Anyone else? Um, victory? I say victory. Are you really sure about that? Think I'm about it. I'm really sure that we'll There were email campaigns in to all the co-founders. Gawker actually lost a ton of money from basically that <gasps> thing with David Geffner and all their other stuff. And their ad revenue has actually gone sliding down. We have Polygon outright claiming the mobile market is failing and somehow that's the gamer's fault for not being interested. I would argue the community now is messy, but it's far from over. Especially when basically, I forget if it was Krokotaku or Polygon, but when they said about the Fatal Frame stuff being censored, they said, good you did that or we would have written negative headlines. So like, I can't stand for that. You should never pressure games like that. You should let the artists make what they want. Artists are making what they want, and they're making titles that look like things like this, and that, and this. And here's what I'm doing as a woman in games. It's not about to go away. What I'm showing you is that I'm not alone, and that we are actually doubling the number of women in computer science related fields by adding creativity and interactivity to it. So I feel a lot of pride about that, and I don't think women are about to go away from this domain. In fact, we're beginning Are you to the So let me go further with my talk. That was never what I Not only are we about. attracting women, but in fact, retaining them, 88% retention in game design programs, compared to even the best numbers with private institutions, around 70%. So game design programs are not only attracting a more diverse audience, we're actually keeping them as well. When you look at things like how well alums are doing from game design programs in industry, it turns out that 82.9% are actually so-called thriving at work on Cantrell scales. Let me see if I think I have other. Oh, no, I didn't include them. Um, and if you're interested, so this is my favorite talking point, because workplace satisfaction right now, you might imagine, could be far further down. But it turns out that people graduating from our programs actually are thriving. And about half of students graduating from game design programs are going into games industry. But the other half are entering all these other domains, from security to uh, web design to education to psychology to new companies, et cetera. So regardless of the difference between in-game industry or out-of-game industry, um, alumni from game design programs are faring really well. I don't have the slide in here, but the national average, what is this? The salary for a first-year graduating student in game design is one and a half times the average for college graduates in the nation. One and a half times. And when we looked at, does it matter if they're in or out of industry? It didn't matter. So regardless of what field they're going into, their averages are much higher for college graduates, which are pretty exciting, I think. It's actually not, um, this isn't that new. There's a long conversation about adding creative arts to computer science, and it turns out when you do that, you attract more people and you retain them better. Turns out they're thriving in the workplace as well. Um, I want to leave a few minutes for questions. And Kurt talked earlier about our center, so I'm going to skip some of that. I am going to get to one sort of main plea. And that's that this frame that we have for education and impact, my language over the years has loosened from being someone who studies education and literacy and these topics that are domains to someone who just studies impact, right? But this sort of frame we have, um, of how technology could fit in classrooms is really, really, really broken. And history has proven this to be true. So a lot of the discussion around technology and learning is about matching Common Core and, well, these days, using all those rich data streams for assessment of kids, basically to do what we're already doing in schools. Now this is one of my favorite slides, because this is about the National Television Network 
1962 that was heavily funded by the Ford Foundation, right? Ford Foundation, best of intentions, said television is going to change the America. It's going to change how we do schools. So we're going to pour a ton of philanthropic money into it. And what they created was this national television network, which, by the way, later evolved into a public broadcasting system right on. So big impact. But here's what happened. Take a look at what's on the screen. It's a bunch of kids sitting in a classroom in rows <laughs> watching kids sitting in the classroom in rows, right? You literally have television being used to do exactly what we were already doing in schools. And this is what I would argue is the wrong frame, right? To me, the reason I love games in the end is that I think games are this incredible sort of Trojan horse for progressive pedagogy, for the kinds of things we know kids learn from that are inspiring and goal-driven and sticky and weird and ex exploratory that we have all but lost in classrooms. So the wrong frame here is taking games and using them to do what we already do. I don't like that. Here's the other wrong frame. <laughs> I've already made fun of it. I won't even say the words again. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to skip over the center stuff, but I will make one last plea. And that's that for all the people here who are, well, so for all the people here who are doing design, think about spending just one tenth of a year, two weeks, four weeks, right? Think about spending that time on solving a really important national problem. Maybe education isn't the thing. Maybe it's peace, love, and happiness. Maybe it's you know, saving the environment, but just take a portion of that creative energy that you've got and think about putting it towards solving like a collective problem that we have. Scratch national, make it global, make it a world problem. Just think about putting energy toward it. I mean, the reason, you know, I think that games are so transformative in education is that, you know, Maria Montessori was about education is a natural process carried out by, by the child. And it's not by listening to words, it's through experiences. Well, things like screens and games, games in particular, are the one medium right now that turns screen time into activity time. It's a vehicle for engaging people and sometimes having first-person experiences. And I think they're really transformative because of that. So my call to arms would simply be, if you could take a portion of the creativity, just like the indie scene has done, without having to like be mandated or grant funded, but just saying, I'd like to explore a war game where you're actually a civilian rather than the person behind the gun. What's that like? And it turns out you end up making an experience that I would argue is worth anyone having. So I will stop there and I have about two minutes for questions. <laughs> Maybe two or three questions. All right, I'll stop there. <laughs> questions? Yes? Where do your kids go to school? Private Montes uh, one is in private Montessori, and the other one is at a private progressive. And I'm uncomfortable with that, because I believe in public education. I, I, I have a lot of personal, so anyone who wants to discuss this, as my husband will know, we believe in public education. But you find yourself realizing that it's hard to know what kind of things education should look like and not providing them for the people that you love. So that's it. Other questions? No, I've heard enough from you. So we're going to let that go for a minute. We can talk afterwards. Yes? Can you say a little bit about uh, your experience in looking at games and neuroscience? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I skipped over it, and I will not go into too much drugs. But I will say that you know when you're in the White House, you get to sort of make things happen by sort of putting a, planting a flag. And my one, like you can do it a couple times. You can't do it every week because people won't buy it. But my, one of my big flags was this. And I was so proud of it that we talked about games, neuroscience, and well-being. And by well-being, I mean emotional and attentional well-being through contemplative practices, through thinking about how we could make a, a safer, more humane world by helping people sort of be able to self-regulate attention, emotion, meditate. So we had this wonderful convening. Um, since that time, with the help of the Gates Foundation, we worked with Richie Davidson, this guy who, who um, He's kind of famous for wiring up the Dalai Lama. He started affective neuroscience. He does with neuroplasticity. So we built two games based on this title. This is in Jubo, which is a meditation app. We just had the results come out a week or two ago. We had a lot of fun building it. And this is a, this is a different 
another title that we built that was on social acuity. So we had this great, we had a great time building an RPG full of these little characters that had no language. You had to actually interact with them in emotionally expressive ways. And the game was entirely built around helping people actually attend to and recognize the emotional states of others because it turns out we don't do that very well, even though we think we do. Um, there's one of them. This is my little broccoli kid. <laughs> Aww. Right. Um, it was an incredible experience. I will say, in this case, we took our two titles and we did a very complex study with fMRIs before and after and classic traditional psychology tests before and after. And then we gathered all the telemetry data so you can see which kids are actually compliant and what they're doing and when they're doing it, which is illuminating when you're working with psychologists who are like, no, 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 no. We gave the intervention. We don't need to open up that black box. And you're like, I'm opening it. I'm going to show you what they're doing. Um, and we also decided to compare them to huge wins on the market. We thought, rather than compare them to textbooks or other experiences that we know are kind of lame, let's actually compare them to like games that have the same sort of beat or rhythm in them. So we compared them to Fruit Ninja and Bastion. I'm trying to decide whether or not I can talk about results. I can't talk about results yet because they're embargo. But um, we found significant results on this title compared to Fruit Ninja around self-regulation of attention and neural change after two weeks of gameplay for just 30 minutes a day. So that's pretty exciting. Um, the thing I found so interesting is not only is the science that you're doing different, but just simply imagine working with this incredible team of neuroscientists who study contemplation and meditation, whose idea of spring break is to go on a silent retreat. So imagine putting that team with like our design team whose idea of vacation is to like get a cheap pony keg and have a Nerf gun war, right? Like getting those two teams to not only understand each other, but to trust each other enough to really get into the business of design was really illuminating um, and probably the biggest outcome of our work. Plus, you get to do stuff like demo your games with like Matthew Ricard, one of the most famous Buddhist monks there. He's known as being the happiest brain alive. I was like, can I take a picture of you just demoing our game? Um, what do you think of it? Uh, by the way, he said it was not hard enough. So, it was, so we made it harder, right? But it was, uh, it was an incredible experience. We're still in the middle of it. I really hope that it's the beginning of the work we do there and not the end. Other questions? Well, I hope everyone sticks around for the social. Sorry we ran five minutes late, but I would love to hear more about what everyone's doing here. Thank you for sitting for so long.